And now I ask that you turn your attention to the large screens for a brief video presentation that offers an important glimpse into the wonder, vision, and passion that has distinguished our guest speaker today as not only a renowned scientific leader, but also a messenger of hope for our world's future. The most astounding fact is the knowledge that the atoms that comprise life on Earth, the atoms that make up the human body, are traceable to the crucibles that cooked light elements into heavy elements in their core under extreme temperatures and pressures. These stars, the high mass ones among them, went unstable in their later years. They collapsed and then exploded, scattering their enriched guts across the galaxy. Guts made of carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and all the fundamental ingredients of life itself. These ingredients become part of gas clouds that condense, collapse, form the next generation of solar systems stars with orbiting planets. And those planets now have the ingredients for life itself. So that when I look up at the night sky, and I know that, yes, we are part of this universe, we are in this universe, but perhaps more important than both of those facts is that the universe is in us. When I reflect on that fact, I look up Many people feel small because they're small and the universe is big, but I feel big because my atoms came from those stars. There's a level of connectivity. That's really what you want in life. You want to feel connected. You want to feel relevant. You want to feel like a, you're a participant in the goings-on of activities and events around you. That's precisely what we are just by being alive. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Neil deGrasse Tyson. Thank you. I don't know what to add to what you just saw. I should just sit back down after that. Uh, thank you for this warm introduction and the video accompaniment to it. Uh, that was, I was just sitting in my office at that time and conducting a little Q&A with Time Magazine, it was just Time's 10 questions that had been asked by the public. And they came in and they recorded it and it sat there for like five years. That was on the internet, but just a few months ago, someone attached visual imagery to it. And so I think by doing so, greatly enhanced the video because you're not just simply looking at me, you're looking at the universe. And of course the message is about the universe. And so that video, in fact, went viral. So thank you for sharing that for those who don't yet own a computer, who didn't yet see it. Uh, I, I'm supposed to give some acceptance remarks, and I thought to myself, well, you're about to like graduate, so let me offer you some wisdom, perhaps, that you might not have gleaned yet in life. But just, I need, just in, the in, in the interest of disclosure, uh, since I'm born and raised in New York City, uh, I, I'm a Yankee fan. I just want to say, I just want to say, I, I, I'm just saying. I, so the difference is, here, here's, here's an interesting difference. Uh, in New York, when the Red Sox come to town, you, you can buy a you know, Red Sox Sox t-shirt, you know, you could do that, but you can't really buy a Red Sox Sox t-shirt at any other time of the year. But in Boston, okay, it was midwinter. I was in Faneuil Hall. There was snow on the ground, and there's a whole display of Yankee Sucks paraphernalia. And I thought, <laughs> so I mean, the feelings are mutual, but not all year round. That's that's the only difference. Uh, personally, I, in college, I used to wrestle, and I want to thank the lighting designer of this room for leaving the one light on over the wrestling banner in the back of the room there, uh, just as a note. Got four wrestlers right here in the front. 
I, I just want to just highlight a few things. I, I'm worried, really, about how much sort of fuzzy thinking is going on in the world. Uh, you know, fuzzy thinking. People are just not thinking straight. And I, I try to think hard about what's, what was behind it. And I, I reflect on a time with my sister. My sister is younger than I. I'm four years older. So I'm like a whole school ahead of her, right? So I'm graduating high school. She's entering high school. I'm graduating college. She's entering college. And so one time I said, so Lynn, where do you want to go have lunch today? Because we I had some cash and I, you know. And she said, well, what are my choices? And it was odd because I didn't realize until that moment that she was not yet capable of simply coming up with a fresh idea. Why? Because she'd spent her whole life taking multiple choice tests. So I ask a question, she wants choices in front of her to pick from. This would continue the whole life. And then I tested this with other people. People want choices. And I realized Maybe it's hard to just think originally and come up with a fresh thought that the person who's offering the question hadn't thought up yet. Because I think somehow in our society we're, we're hell-bent on the answer. The answer, the right answer. Because when it's the right answer, it's the right answer. And when it's the wrong answer, it's not the right answer. Consider this following example. Imagine you have a spelling bee. This is contrived, but it makes the point. There's a spelling bee, and you have to spell the word cat. Okay. So one student spells it C-A-T. Person got it right. The next person spells it K-A-T. That's wrong. You got that wrong. Okay. Third person spells it XQW. Do you realize that is marked equally as wrong with the KAT? <laughs> when you could argue that KAT is a better spelling for cat than CAT. Dictionaries know this because that's how they spell it phonetically. And so we've built a system for ourselves where there is an answer and everything else is not the answer, even when some answers are better than others. So our brains are absent the wiring capable of coming up with an original thought or thought not previously considered or thought between the ideas that are already laid on the table. What we're not valuing is knowledge as process rather than knowledge as an answer. In another example, a little contrived, but it, it brings the point home a little, even a little more strongly. If you're an employer and two candidates come up looking for a job, and this is, again, a contrived example, and, and you're interviewing the two candidates, and, and you say, oh, as for part of this interview, I just want to ask you, What's the height of the spire on this building that we're in? And the candidate says, oh, I was, I, I was, a, I was a, uh, uh, an architect. I've majored in architecture for a while, and I memorized the heights of all the buildings on campus. I know. The height of that spire is 150 feet. In fact, 155 feet tall. Okay, turns out that's the right answer. That's the right answer. And the person came up with it in seconds. That person goes away. The next candidate walks in. Uh, do you know the height of the spire on this building? The candidate says, no, but I'll be right back. Person runs outside, measures the length of the shadow of that spire on the ground, measures the length of her, her own shadow, ratios the height to the shadows, comes up with a number. Runs back inside, it's about 150 feet. Who are you gonna hire? I'm hiring the person who figured it out, even though it took that person longer, 
even though the person's answer is not as precise. I'm hiring that person, because that person knows how to use the mind in a way not previously engaged. You realize when you know how to think, it empowers you far beyond those who know only what to think. In fact, I should tweet that. That's a tweetable thought. I mean, <laughs> just hang on a sec. I'm going to tweet that. Just forgive me. I'm just, excuse me. I beg forgiveness here. Let me. Actually, I don't beg forgiveness, I demand it. <laughs> Knowing how to think. See if that goes out. Okay, maybe that just went. We'll see. Sorry about that. That's... Every now and then I feel compelled to textify, you know, so. Um, so I, I see your graduation, you know, this, there's a great uh, opening lines here about uh, how many days were left till the end of the semester and then revealing it was the faculty who were so eager. Uh, you know, so many people can't wait till school ends, can't wait till the summer holidays and, and, and like, what do you know, what do you, what do you know hurry to do? To stop learning? This is the only time in your life where your job was to learn. That was your job. That's, that's all people expected of you. Now you're being cast forth, and I'm hoping, I'm expecting that you're not saying to yourself, I'm done learning. Because if that's how you think and feel, you will slide back to the cave. Because everyone else who keeps learning will pass you by, and that's where you'll end up, even if you didn't think you were headed there. And so this act of learning tells me that as you exit this institution, newly sanctioned university, just in time, by the way, for in astrophysics, we're working on the multiverse rather than the universe. So a uh, few years, it might be the multiverse city. You know, I just want to <laughs> say, just get ready for that one when we, when we come, the multiverse. I'm just saying, I don't know. So think of your graduation, think of this moment as the beginning of learning, not the end of learning. And if anyone gives you a choice, say, don't even give me a choice, let me think up an answer all by myself. It's once been said that there's no greater pain to the human mind than the prospect of a new idea, because old ideas bring comfort. Well, I, I want every single one of you to lead a painful, discomfortable life. <laughs> and in that pain and discomfort, you'll make discoveries that can transform this world in all the ways that it desperately needs. Thank you all for your time and attention.